Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin Hedges. Um, I'm an occupational hygienist with OCARE, um, and it gives me great pleasure to um, welcome you all to our COVID Conversations Back to School Safety, Collaborating on Solutions for Cleaner School Air. Um, I'll be hosting this webinar uh, in collaboration with Amanda, who is the member of the Canadian COVID-19 School Safety Group. Firstly, I'd just like to uh, provide a land acknowledgement. I would like to begin by acknowledging that from Canada, Ottawa, Ottawa, Canada, to all First Nations, Inuit, Metis peoples, in recognition of valuable past and present contributions to this land, Ottawa is on the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. Uh, I just also want to refer to Dr. Peter Bryce, um, who was a real hero. He actually worked for the government. He was, he was responsible for um, Indigenous children in schools. And he did actually um, talk to um, the authorities in the government he worked with at the time. Um, he talked about poor ventilation and poor standards of care. Um, a, a lot of what he provided was ignored. Um, as, after he left the government, he actually did produce this report. And he found, which noted that roughly one quarter of all Aboriginal children attending residential schools died of tuberculosis. So with this webinar, um, it's around schools and transmission, as well as being uh, centres of learning for our youth, schools are workplaces for thousands of teachers and staff. What happens in schools affects millions of children and their families and can drive illness and infection rates in society at large. Um, the, the June um, Centre for Infectious Disease Research and Policy article from the underlying JAMA study note, highlights that 70.4% of all household transmissions began with a child and rates clearly dropped until school breaks. So also the, the same, this is a very good site. Um, the CIDRAP has really good uncensored information and they do talk about, you know, even though COVID seems to be um, dropping, there's still concerns, especially in the Western Pacific region, um, including Australia. And you could ask the question that they're kind of towards the end of their winter now, which may be feeding into that. I also found this article um, in preparation for this webinar. And um, there's actually been an alarming number of um, respiratory things Cytial virus cases, RSV cases, close to 10 times higher in some states, especially in, in South Australia. Um, and we all know that this, the, the research is out to show that, you know, RSV, like COVID-19, is airborne as well. Uh, OCO have, um, over a year ago now, it really needs, we need to relook at this, did provide a ventilation checklist. And John Udick also developed a, uh, a ventilation calculator for schools, which is on the OK website. Um, the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers have a new standard, 241P. Um, so we asked the question, what now? And this, I just came across this on the web um, from John Hopkins. Um, where they note that experts encourage US states to create legislation aimed at improving indoor air quality in public spaces. They actually have a new model state act as a framework. Um, so um, I just want to kind of introduce you to the agenda. Uh, we've, firstly, we've got Amanda Hu, who's a member of the Canadian uh, COVID-19 School Safety Group. Uh, there's also a, a person from Australia, he's provided a, a recording for us, Brad Present. Um, uh, from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, he's the Vice President International, who was the Vice President International Society of Indoor Air Quality and Climate. Uh, we're really glad that Joey's come back again. Um, and I'll go through each each person's bio quickly. And we're also really glad that um, that Paul Sedestri um, for, for QP is joining us as well. And then we're going to kind of wrap it up with um, how can we all make it happen? How can we work together? So just to Brad um, kindly pulled together a presentation for us. Um, it's kind of an ungodly hour there at the moment. So he, he was prepared to do it live, but 
he did provide a recording for us. Um, so he's a public health and occupational health scientist with, with an epidemiology and public health pers perspective. He has assessed in, indoor air quality and ventilation, airports, hospitals, public buildings, and schools since 1979. He's one of 50 persons worldwide with the designation C Certified Industrial Hygienist with a subspecialty indoor air quality. In 20, and, and 2020 and 21, uh, Brad President assessed ventilation, airborne transmission of COVID in various public buildings, schools, designed the first easy to use risk calculator calculating the risk of COVID-9 infection and supervised a team of engineers and contractors to redesign hotel quarantine ventilation on behalf of uh, coronavirus quarantine Victoria. And as I said, we're really uh, very grateful that Joey's um, come back again. Uh, many people on this um, on this webinar will know Joey. He's been such a great advocate, but he's an engineer. He's a professional engineer, and he's been providing some amazing guidance uh, chair, as chair of the Indoor Air Quality Advisory Committee for the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers. And he has a really great website. Um, it's airborne.com, and I, 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 I suggest that you have a look at that because there's amazing information there. Um, we're really glad that Amanda Hughes uh, working with us too on this. We're uh, collaborating with Amanda. We're pulling this together collectively. Uh, Amanda's an advocate, maker, parent, and community member at Mockintis, Calgary, Alberta, fighting for better indoor spaces. Her background is reflected. Her breadth of interest includes work in governance, contemporary art, medical advocacy, and nonprofit administration. She holds a BFA with distinction in visual studies and BA with distinction in psychology from the University of Calgary and is a National Air Filtration Association Certified Technician Level 1. <clears throat> um, Paul Silvestri, um, who's on the staff with the Canadian Union of Public Employees or CUPE in their health and safety branch, uh, he provides knowledge and support to CUPE members in healthcare, social services, municipal school boards, and post secondary. Be before working for CUPE, Paul worked for 25 years as an education work worker with the uh, Conseil Scolaire Catholique uh, Providence, excuse my French, and was an active member of the CUPE Local 4299. Paul is a board member of the Workers' Health and Safety Centre and represent CUPE on the Provincial Working Group on Health and Safety for the Education Sector, and previously on Ontario's Section 21 Healthcare Committee. He works out of CUPE's regional office in Markham, Ontario, but still, call, still calls Windsor home. His passion lies in consensus building among stakeholders towards better health and safety conditions for everyone in the workplace. Um, so we're really grateful to have such a great um, collective of collective group of people. And uh, what I'll do now is hand you over to Amanda. Uh, over to Amanda. Thank you very much. Maybe muted, Amanda. Great. I'm just getting used to WebEx. Apologies, everyone. Okay, so everyone can see my slides. Yes, I think. Please, great, please. perfect. So the the really exciting part of this webinar for me is that um, we get to talk about one of the things that actually has come out of the pandemic that has been positive and and fruitful is the collaboration for a cleaner future. And it's something where um, we, uh, you know, we we look at all of these different things and it's a multidisciplinary problem. Um, and so as Kevin kind of alluded to, and as I think a lot of people are aware, um, but less than we'd like, uh, is that schools seed outbreaks into communities. And so, um, you know, I think we get a lot of people who say, you know, well, why should I really care about schools? You know, it's just kids are kids get sick. What are we going to do? 
But schools are the epicenter for outbreaks into communities and, and many studies um, have shown this and I think it just makes a lot of common sense. And so we have uh, schools that, you know, seed outbreaks into homes, those families get sick, they go into workplaces, they put load on hospitals. And so this is a multifaceted issue because it is a workplace safety issue for the staff in schools. Um, and then it's also a safety issue for children. And then it is a safety issue for communities. Um, and so we, uh, we had a terrible winter last year, um, for, for kids and respiratory illness, especially, um, you know, these are some of the headlines from last year, the Red Cross coming in to help one of the largest, uh, children's hospitals in Canada, um, you know, hospitals overrun unprecedented situations, urgent situations, intense, you know, heated trailers outside of children's hospitals. And so this was, um, you know, an unparalleled season of illness and it impacted students and their health. It impacted teachers and their health and it impacted learning outcomes. And it was um, a lot of suffering for a lot of people. So as we look to what we can anticipate for the fall, um, there's, you know, one potential future and, you know, epidemiologists tell us that we can look to Australia for what we can possibly see for our winter. Um, and they've had a pretty bad winter. It's, you know, the horrendous flu strain, um, triple whammy. So again, the triple demic is back and a roller coaster of illness. And so we, we are already starting to see this in, in the states where schools have come back a bit earlier. And so what can we be doing to, this is one potential future, but we have this unparalleled opportunity as well to change the future potentially. And so, you know, what has been this thing that has come out of the pandemic is this, you know, new multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder advocacy. And so really parents looking and saying, we want a safe environment for our kids. Teachers and staff, you know, they deserve a safe environment to work in. Um, you know, occupational health and safety, it's, you shouldn't get sick or become disabled from going to work. Um, and the indoor air quality experts um, have come through and have provided so much knowledge and have been so generous with their time and information. And we built these partnerships um, and this could be stronger because safe work environments um, for teachers and staff are also safe learning environments for students. Um, and then, we can look to, you know, unions being the key to collective action for this and um, looking at, you know, how we can all be working together to provide this safe environment that uh, will then impact our communities very positively. And so this is a, a very exciting discussion to have because we have this new information with this new standard. And, um, you know, it's talking about the things that we've done um, across the country as advocates that, um, have worked, what we would like to do better, and, you know, what possibilities there are for that better future. Thanks so much, Amanda. Um, and we might um, now go back to you, Tony, if you'd like to, to play the video um, from Brad or the recording from Brad. Thanks again. Good day. As we say here in Australia, thank you very much for inviting me to speak about primary and secondary schools and infectious aerosols and indoor air quality in a more general sense. Well, this is a bit of an outline of what I'd like to cover. Uh, I'd like to talk about the compelling case for good indoor air quality. We'll touch on natural versus mechanical ventilation. I'll show you a resource that I think would be quite useful for you going forward, this ERA Schools brochure. And then we'll talk about some of the strategies for improvement that have been offered. And uh, we'll finish by talking about one of the most interesting and recent ones, the OSHRAE 241 framework. Air quality has long been neglected in primary and secondary schools. Uh, I think maybe I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, for example, just as one of many, many studies, this pre-pandemic study, looking at four primary and one secondary schools, looked at 10 typical classrooms, identified that 60% of them were underventilated compared with Australian recommendations of 10 liters per second per person, and all of them had air changes per hour 
less than a half or 0.9 versus the recommendations of four or five, particularly that we heard during the pandemic. Uh, here's another one, for example, this is a much larger study in 301 French schools where 588 classrooms were assessed with week-long measurements of all kinds of environmental parameters, temperature, humidity, VOCs, SVOCs, aldehydes, et cetera. This is just the particulate data, okay? And what they identified was most of the concentrations greater than 90% exceeded the WHO long-term guideline value. Uh, I'm showing you this particular journal, uh, Indoor Environmental Quality and Health of School Buildings, an entire uh, edition devoted to indoor air quality in schools. Uh, and most of these studies are indicating some of the issues. Not only do we understand some of the problems, but uh, I think that there's been a number of studies that have shown the cost benefit case in terms of improving indoor air quality. This one was done by Richard Corsi and colleagues at the, in a central Texas high school. Two years of measuring carbon dioxide, inferring the concentration of exhaled breath and therefore the potential for influenza transmission. And they looked at both portable and permanent classrooms, calculated the risk of infection, and then worked out the cost of those infections and compared that with the cost of properly ventilating the classrooms and made a very good case uh, that the $270 loss per infector uh, vastly exceeded the $24 that would have cost to properly ventilate the buildings. Okay, so we have transitioned into the uh, pandemic uh, and COVID-19 mode. And in this study, which was done in Italy uh, by Giorgio Bonanno, whoops, went a little too quickly. Each additional air change per hour reduced the risk of infection 12 to 15%. So this is a really nice, elegant study showing the importance and value of, of uh, better ventilations. We've talked just briefly now in terms of uh, illness and in terms of uh, the benefits, but there are performance aspects as well that uh, are really enhanced with better ventilation. And this has been looked at for uh, a number of years. This UK-based study looked at primary schools, uh, and it was a crossover study where they put a special ventilation unit into the windows, um, which either ventilated or didn't ventilate. It was a crossover study. And they went from less than one liters per second per person to 15 liters per second per person, and then measured performance on a number of, of, uh, of tests. And they found that the Work rate increased by 7% for addition and subtraction. So kids do better with better ventilation as well as, as stay healthier and avoid infection. Um, this one here showed that uh, it's a review study which looked at many, many different schools. And this is back in 2005, right? So we now understand that this has been something that's been brewing along for quite a long time with not a lot of paying attention to these types of, uh, of issues. Okay, so we know that improved ventilation reduces disease transmission. We know that it improves uh, performance. Uh, right now, it's very difficult to see all of these types of changes implemented uh, because, number one, uh, most of any code language addresses design, and basically none of the code language addresses operation. In many cases, we can get improvements that support sustainability goals. And I think that sometimes people present this false dichotomy that, uh, you know, you can't have good indoor air quality and sustainability, but in many cases, you really can. And of course, that really should be the goal, is that we maintain our sustainability goals while improving the indoor air quality. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears a tiny bit here and, and talk a little bit about natural uh, versus mechanical ventilation. At least here in Australia, many, many school designs uh, rely on operable windows for ventilation. And in the code, there's a calculation you do as to based on the floor area, how many square meters, uh, where you need to have windows and the number of windows and the uh, operable ability of those windows, et cetera. And that's what many designers rely upon for ventilation. 
Mechanical HVAC designs can sometimes provide a certain amount of flexibility, um, but sometimes the equipment is installed and it is what it is, and that's about that's about all you get. Uh, in either case, whether it be natural or ventilation, there are sometimes pretty simple solutions that don't involve costly retrofits. So we know that during the pandemic, people were instructed how to manage their uh, their natural ventilation. For example, uh, this came out of the document that I, I will be mentioning to you shortly. Uh, if you have operable windows, what can you do that simply enhances the flow? You know, getting the best on the right hand side, two openings on opposite walls is going to create the greatest uh, air exchange for ventilation. So sometimes there's some pretty, pretty easy solutions uh, for mechanical systems. Um, and we heard this a lot during the pandemic, increase the outdoor air percentage by opening the outdoor air damper. Uh, and sometimes on a less sophisticated system, this means going up to the roof and physically uh, turning the, the little screw uh, and changing the position of the damper. Uh, but on more sophisticated systems, it may be something that's controlled electronically through the building management system. Um, for a what we call a variable air volume system or a VAV system, which is common in larger, more technically sophisticated buildings in terms of the HVAC. Uh, a VAV system modulates the total amount of air being delivered, uh, reduces the circulation within the space, and also as the VAV system goes down to a percentage, a smaller percentage of maximum flow, say 20% of maximum flow, it's also reducing the ventilation and outdoor air delivery. So operating that system more in a constant volume mode, closer to its 100% value, uh, it might be a way to improve the situation very simply. Programming the building management system to conduct flush cycles, whether it be in the morning or after classes, is another way that this is, these are just software changes, basically. So um, there's, there's really quite a few things that can be done, and uh, you want to go for that low-hanging fruit as much as possible for both the natural and the mechanical ventilation systems. Uh, I, I referred to this COVID ventilation optimization guide for schools. Uh, I authored this on behalf of ARA, which is the Australian Institute of Refrigerating, Air Conditioning and Heating Engineers. This is a good document that I think could be a resource for you. And uh, you'll have a copy of this talk. At the bottom there, you can see uh, you just kind of Clip in that URL and that'll bring you to the document. And it covers four important aspects. Uh, it's very specific to schools. It's written uh, at, at the level of uh, school staff and faculty would understand. It covers airborne transmission, building ventilation systems, air cleaning technologies, and building a strategy for your facility. So that's something that hopefully will, will be useful to you. Okay, uh, defining a framework for improvement. How do we go forward from this? And I think that we heard a lot during the pandemic uh, on operational, very general guidance in terms of how we can operate our systems to optimize the ventilation. Uh, these non-specific recommendations were, were helpful for sure, generally, <laughs> um, but I don't think they provided really the strength of guidance that we would like. So uh, in the last year or so, uh, for sure, we've seen a number of different institutions, and, and I put these two up because they've been both quite influential. The Healthy Buildings Program at Harvard School of Public Health, the US EPA, where they're recommending minimum air changes per hour. And the number that you typically see for most buildings is five air changes per hour. So this is certainly one approach, and up until ASHRAE 241 was introduced in the last few months, that was really the, the state of the art. ASHRAE 241 really takes things in a bit of a different direction, and uh, we'll, we'll, let's explore that, and I'll, I'll explain to you a little bit about how it came about and what it does that's different. So uh, the background here is uh, the Biden administration and the White House really pushed as part of their COVID preparedness plan, they pushed OSHRAE, the uh, American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, to come up with some type of a, a standard for operating building ventilation systems during periods of high 
concern for infectious disease, not necessarily COVID only, but perhaps the successor to COVID or perhaps something that could operate during flu season. Um, and in December 2022, they said, do this in six months, which is a re really short period of time for a standard to be developed. In May, it went out for public review um, and it was finally published in July. I was one of about 40 professionals on this committee drafting the standard. So what does it actually say? Um, any, any green you see in these next few slides is the actual quotes from the standard. The blue and black writing is my interpretation. So the goal of the standard is to establish minimum requirements for control of infectious aerosols to reduce the risk of disease, including requirements for both outdoor air and air cleaning system design, installation, commissioning, operations, and maintenance. So it's not only looking at outdoor air uh, delivery as one way of providing dilution and reduction of infection control, but also air cleaning uh, and other, other factors. It's designed to be applied in both new and existing buildings. So some caveats about it, what it, it isn't. It, it doesn't maintain acceptable air quality from a general perspective. It's not intended to work with all infective agents. Uh, it only addresses long range transmission. So if you're within one and a half or two meters of someone, the ventilation system uh, in the room is not gonna make a difference. You're so close that uh, dilution of the air around you is, is not really very possible by the mechanical system. So it's only gonna function for long range transmission. And it doesn't tell you when to go into what I'll talk to you about is an infection control mode. So basically the concept here is that you have a switch, uh, at least a theoretical switch, and the building can operate under normal mode. And then if it's flu season or if there's a pandemic, it could switch into an infection control mode. But it doesn't tell you when to do that. In theory, that's left to the public health authorities or to the building owners to determine the need for it. Some definitions. Um, this infection reduction mode is, is, is abbreviated IRMM, the mode of operation in which measures to reduce the aerosol exposure are active. Another term that's used throughout the document is the equivalent clean airflow, uh, V sub ECA sub I, the theoretical flow rate of air would, that would have the same effect on the infectious aerosol concentration as the sum of the actual outdoor airflow, filtered airflow, and inactivation of infectious aerosols. So this equivalent clean airflow is what we're gonna be talking about here. And finally, I won't be discussing, but your next speaker will be discussing this building readiness plan, a plan that documents all of the controls in a facility that are gonna be utilized during this infection risk management mode. Okay, so there's two equations that are key to understanding this. Uh, the first one basically says that the total clean flow to a space in liters per second uh, is the function of the number you pull out of the table based upon the space type, that's a per person number, times the number of persons in the space. So key to this 241 standard is the fact that you can achieve a less infectious environment not only by bringing in outdoor air or cleaning the air, but also by reducing the occupancy number. And the logic of that is that fewer people means the risk of a, an infected person being present is lowered, and therefore you can get credit, so to speak, under the standard for choosing a reduced occupancy factor. So the minimum equivalent clean airflow rate, uh, shall be determined in accordance with 5.1. And this is the engineering version of what I just told you. Uh, the rate is the total rate into the space. The VECAI is the total number of liters per second coming into the space. The ECAI is what you pull out of the table and the p-value is the number of people in the room. So a per person value times the number of people gives you the total flow. This is what the standard looks like. So there's about, um, 25 different types of occupancies that are listed. And for each, uh, fortunately for those of us who are in the US, they listed in liters per second per person as well as CFM per person. Um, and it comes through, it cuts through residential as well as commercial. 
Um, and, and this is the number that we're talking about. This is the ECA sub I number. So if you look down there in the center, you see educational facilities, classroom and lecture hall, 20 liters per second per person is the equivalent clean airflow rate for schools. Now, there might be a minimum 10 liters per second per person that would be kind of a pre-existing minimum ventilation rate. And this is saying that you need to achieve the 20 liters per second per person times the number of people in the room in order to determine how much flow is going to go into the room of clean air, not just outdoor air, clean air. So the yellow highlighted numbers here are those ECA sub I numbers in liters per second per person. Uh, and the next column are, is the ASHRAE 62.1 assumed occupancy for that space per 100 square meters. Okay, so every space, defined space in 62.1 has an assumed occupancy present. And you can see here, if we look at the input assumptions from 62.1 for a classroom on the left-hand side, it's 5 liters per second per person plus 0.6 liters per square meter, and there's assumed to be 35 persons per 100 square meters. It works out to something close to that because of the conversion from, from meters to, to square foot. Uh, if we then look on the right-hand side, um, and we look at the air changes per hour that are going to result from that, okay, under 241 in a classroom, we're going from 6.1 liters per second per person total to 20 liters per second per person, and that works out to, to be uh, an air exchange rate of 10 and a half air changes per hour with a 2.7 meter ceiling. Okay, so you could see that like for, for an office, we're only looking at 1.1 air changes per hour, and for a restaurant, we're looking at 31. So why is it that we have such vastly different air changes per hour? Well, it turns out the way that uh, 241 was designed is that it keeps a constant risk across the occupancy for a one hour occupancy period. So if you spend an hour in an office uh, and you're in compliance with 241 based upon that 15 liters per second per person and based upon the typical occupancy of an office, your risk of infection will be the same as if you spend an hour in a classroom uh, with a 20 liters per second per person of equivalent clean air. And that works out to be a much higher exchange rate. So any type of a environment that has a density of occupation ends up with a much higher air exchange rate because the risk is higher. So we haven't made the air exchange rate equivalent across occupancy types. We've made the risk equivalent across occupancy types and allowed the air change per hour to vary on that basis. You can see that very clearly. So that's one aspect. And the second aspect of the standard is this summing up of all of the various air cleaning systems that are going into the, into the uh, removal of the pathogens from the airstream. So we have two things operating. We've got outdoor air coming in and diluting and removing some of the pathogens in the air. And we have air cleaning systems. So the standard basically says you add up all the contribution of the different devices and ensure that they exceed the target ECAI value. And that's basically just what it says here in engineering legalese type, uh, type uh, notation. So the sum of all of the various air cleaning devices plus the ventilation has to exceed that uh, ECA sub I number for the space. And they provide a really nice calculator that enables you to do that. Uh, in that third column, you've got the existing situation, and then you can go through various planning options. In this case, they went through four planning op options where they've changed the uh, orientation or type of air cleaning uh, and come up with whether or not you pass or fail under the system. And that's, a, that's an appendix and it's a reference where you could go and pull that spreadsheet. Okay, so these two equations, uh, the ECAI number times the number of people is the total flow into the space. And then you sum up all of the air cleaning devices uh, to see whether or not you exceed that value. That's pretty much the entire standard. 
Everything else is uh, technical appendices and elaboration and certifications and other types of, of engineering things. So I'll just go through very quickly what those things are covered. Uh, they talk about different types of air distribution systems and what the permitted air cleaning systems are in terms of whether they discharge horizontally, vertically, and the like. Um, there's a whole section on air cleaning testing and effectiveness. Uh, how do you test the air cleaners that are used? What are the standards? Um, that, and there's a big piece of the standard on planning and documentation, which will be addressed by the next speaker. Um, there's a whole section on how to operate and maintain the system. And then there's a series of appendices. I'm just going to talk very quickly about the logic here as to how they came up with the numbers, um, which was basically a, this is, this is a chart from, from the, the, the uh, standard where they basically looked at a number of factors associated with the exhalation of infective particulate. So how is that exhaled? What is its deposition on surfaces? What is its deposition within the body? Okay, what fraction deposits in the respiratory system? And all of that information went into what's like a Monte Carlo approach. So basically, if you can imagine uh, a slot machine with not three spinning disks like on the left, but 17 or 18, in the Monte Carlo approach, what you do is you allow each of these wheels to spin uh, among the value that a particular parameter exhibits. So, for example, if you're looking at deposition in the respiratory system, we know you have an average, you have a standard deviation. So, with this Monte Carlo approach, you spin the slot machine 10,000 times, and each of these variables comes up with some number, and then you look at the risk that that presents and then aggregate the entire thing. So, that's kind of how it was done. Um, what's called this Monte Carlo simulation, considering many different factors uh, to come up with the risk of infection. And it was standardized across these one hour occupancies for space. So quite a bit of attention went into the logic and these decisions in this. So looking at the other alternative, like what Harvard and CDC has proposed based on air changes per hour, has some weaknesses by comparison. It doesn't adjust the community prevalence and the number of infectors present in a space. It doesn't allow you to use reduced occupancy as a tool for reduced risk. And if you look at different spaces, you'll find that uh, high ceilings are enormously protective because of the volume of space there. In other words, a person exhaling infective material, their infective material is diluting over a much greater area. Uh, and low ceilings are not protective. So low ceilings need much higher air exchange to equalize the risk. Okay, and the last piece, um, which I won't be addressing, is this uh, building readiness plan, which is a really key piece of uh, 241 because uh, really the devil's in all the details of organizing and planning and being able to implement this infection reduction management mode when, when required. Okay, just to summarize, um, 241 provides a comprehensive framework for managing infection control. Uh, I hope that it's something that becomes uh, commonly utilized. There's some indication that like the GSA, the Government Services Agency that operate the US federal buildings will adopt it for their buildings. Uh, it's written in code compatible language, so a, a public authority in a different location could actually adopt it as code. Uh, the invocation of the IRMM is, is not defined in the standard. It's up to the owner or occupier or some other cognizant authority to say, this is a good time to uh, invoke the IRMM mode. There's multiple ways that you could achieve the targets that are established in the, uh, in the standard, including better ventilation, including filtration, inactivation with UV or some other modality or reducing occupancy. Uh, and it's designed to equalize the risk across the different spaces. It's a very feasible standard to implement, but uh, it you really need to understand your existing system and you need to plan. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today.
And I'm sorry I'm not able to join you and take questions, but uh, please do don't hesitate if you want to email me at any time. Uh, I'm more than happy to respond. So just to add to that, um, Brad's actually provided his um, email on the, on the heading page of his PowerPoint presentation. Um, and he was vice president of ISIAC and he does a lot of work in Australia. So, you know, he can kind of provide, provide some more background information on, on what he's provided. <clears throat> I do see that there was a question put in the chat by Tara. Um, <clears throat> I've just found out about the, uh, the Model Act from James Hopkins. I did have a quick look at it, and the Model Act does refer to 241P. Um, I know uh, Joey's a lot more in tune with, with what's going on than I am. Um, and so probably now's a good time just to not um, say any more, but just to hand you over to Joey. And once again, Joey, thank, thanks for offering to present um, on I think part six of the, of the ESHRA 241P. Thanks again, over to you. Thank you. So I will be speaking about the building readiness plan, but that's not fully the focus of what I shall be discussing. It will be in general in implementing ASHRAE 241 in schools. Uh, let me see, I think this is the wrong one. You might be sharing the wrong screen. Are you able to see the presentation or are you seeing the, are you seeing the next slide thing on the side? No, we're, we're seeing the title slide, implementing ASHRAE 241. In schools. Okay, great. So this is the proper slide. Yep. So I'll be discussing about implementing ASHRAE 241 in schools. I'm going to be assuming that we want to mitigate infection from aerosols. So this will be uh, infection risk management mode. Uh, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Joseph Fox, Joey Fox. I'm a professional engineer. I work in the HVAC field uh, and I'm the chair of the indoor air quality advisory group for the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers. I'll be, there will be slight overlap, but I'll be dealing more on a technical side, uh, actual examples of implementation from what Brad said. Uh, but it, there will be, uh, I'll, I'll take, a, take off from where he left off. Uh, so right now when we design buildings, we design it according to a standard called ASHRAE 62.1. It's not designed for mitigating airborne diseases. It's designed primarily around comfort. And it also addresses off-gassing from materials, which can create formaldehyde in the air and other pollutants. Is it too hard to hear me speak? No, it's yeah, good, good to me. Yep, it, sounds it sounds good, Joey. Okay. All right. Uh, now, the standard almost exclusively uses outdoor air ventilation in order to uh, provide clean air. There is a small section about using particulate, about using better filtration for particulate matter. But in Canada, there is no requirement for that because there's no particulate matter level set. So we do not have any requirements for improved filtration. So ventilation is really all we got when it comes to designing buildings. ASHRAE 241 was developed specifically to control infectious aerosols. Now it does say you should comply with ASHRAE 62.1, so have that minimum ventilation rate. But besides that, it allows any method to be used to provide clean air, and it does not have to be outdoor air. The rate required in classrooms is actually much higher. It's 20 liters per second per person, as Brad went over. Other spaces, whether it's cafeterias or offices, will have different rates. I'll be focusing on classrooms, but the same procedure can apply to all other spaces. And I just showed here a comparison between how we design our buildings and what's what's actually recommended for controlling infectious aerosols. So uh, the rate is actually uh, anywhere from two to ten times higher than our minimum ventilation. So we are underventilating our buildings when it comes to actually protecting people from infectious aerosols. So to go over the tools that we have available, the the primary tool and the one that serves as the basis of adequate air, indoor air quality is supplying outdoor air to the space. Uh, so indoor air is generally much more polluted than outdoor air. So simply exhausting the indoor air and replacing it with outdoor air is the best way to keep concentration of pollutants low. 
Another tool, which again, hasn't been required in Canada, but really should be moving forward. Uh, it's filtration. So you pass the air through a filter and if the filter, depending on how effective it is, how efficient it is, it can remove particles of different sizes when you pass them through it. Uh, to mitigate, to control infectious aerosols, uh, in, and as well as fine particulate matter, you need high efficiency filters, which aren't really used, but hopefully in, in the future we will be using it. UV is another option. It's safe and effective. We've been using it for many years. Often filtration could be used instead. There are two methods of using UV, which are upper room UV and far UV, but they are currently not allowed in Canada. So I'm not going to be discussing them as options. Hopefully in the future they could be, but right now they're not something that we'll be doing. Alternative air cleaners are also something that's marketed. Uh, they can include ionization, photocatalytic oxidation, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl generators, and other different technologies. Currently, it's not regulated. It might be safe and effective, but we know some studies that a lot of them are not safe, and we have studies showing a lot of them are not effective. Until we actually have regulations ensuring that they're safe and effective, the recommendation from the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers is to avoid them and disable them if they exist. So, in the end, the conclusion from this is really ventilation and filtration are the only tools that we have. But they're good enough. So, I'm going to be discussing both what the facilities can do, what school boards can do, and also what individuals can do. I'll start with the school boards. There's this really good report uh, created by the Lancet COVID-19 Commission Task Force, and it discusses the first four building strategies. So the first strategy they recommend is commissioning equipment and ensuring that it is running properly. I don't think this goes far enough. There needs to be transparency about this. You can have people go commission and find everything broken and then not fix it. And unless things are fixed, uh, you're not helping anybody. So there, there should be transparency. Just saying we've checked equipment is really not enough. The next strategy they recommend, which Brad spoke about, is increasing the amount of outdoor air supply to the space. So he discussed the two different ways to do it. One is you increase the percentage of outdoor air and reduce the amount of recirculated air. The other one is it works in variable volume systems. Often, if the temperature is satisfied, you just ramp it down to the bare minimum amount of air supply to the space but the system has within its capability of increasing the total amount of air to the space. So both these ways are methods of increasing the amount of outdoor air and improving ventilation. The next tool they recommend is upgrading the filters to MERV 13. So the standard from ASHRAE 62.1 is MERV 8, unless you're exceeding the national standard. We don't have a national standard in Canada, but most units can be upgraded to MERV-13 filters, and those will be effective at removing infectious aerosols. And the last step that they recommend is supplement with HEPA filters to achieve the target rates. Now we know the target rates based on ASHRAE 241. We can calculate how much, how the cleaner delivery required for those HEPA filters. I will say there's a fifth strategy that should be implemented in schools, and that's monitoring air quality and providing transparency. And the main uh, tracer gas to use is carbon dioxide because it lets you know what the ventilation is. So I'll speak about uh, transparency and disclosure from schools and buildings in general. Now, carbon dioxide monitoring has been used in different ways. Uh, one has been, and I use it this way, to assess the risk of airborne disease transmission. The higher the CO2, the more air you are sharing with other people and the higher the risk, all else being equal especially in Canada where ventilation is the only tool that we have, it, it does a really good job as part of a risk assessment. Now, unfortunately in schools, there is no option to do a risk assessment. You cannot say, oh, this classroom is poorly ventilated. I am not using the classroom. Unfortunately, everyone has to use the rooms. It's not you know, choosing a movie theater or a grocery store. And also if we're using ASHRAE 241, CO2 monitoring can be verif can verify if we're supplying minimum outdoor air, but as long as we're including filtration, we could still create a low risk space. So in the context of schools and facilities who are actually creating proper plans about supplying uh, acceptable indoor air quality, the real way to use CO2 is to measure the outdoor airflow per person. I included charts here on the right hand side 
based on the CO2 levels, you can estimate how much outdoor airflow per person there is. Uh, so in an element, the reason why elementary and high school are different is because little kids uh, don't exhale as much carbon dioxide as older children. As you get older and older, you exhale more carbon dioxide. So the same outdoor airflow rate would lead to different uh, CO2 steady state concentrations. So in an elementary school or in a high school, if you're at 600 ppm or 650 ppm respectively, you actually have 20 liters per second of outdoor airflow per person. So you're compliant with hash rate 241 and the amount of extra air cleaning is zero. As you get to higher and higher CO2 levels, you will need to supply, uh, you will have a lower outdoor airflow per person and you will need to add in more filtration. Now, 1000 ppm is roughly what is required to comply with ASHRAE 62.1. That doesn't necessarily mean it's good. That means you're supplying bare minimum acceptable indoor air quality. If you have CO2 levels higher than that, it means you're not providing minimum ventilation according to the new designs on the building code. But in order to create a low risk space, you still can supplement with filtration. And obviously, places with worse ventilation should have more filtration. The other thing buildings can do in order to provide disclosure is to create a building readiness plan. It's defined in ASHRAE 62241. Uh, it's essentially a document that goes through what's happening in the building. It, it helps ensure equity that all spaces are compliant. Currently, what the guidance is in Ontario is to kind of do what you can improve the amount of outdoor air, upgrade the filtration, and use HEPA filters. There's no target set, and it's do what you can wherever you can. So some places might have fantastic ventilation, some places have very poor ventilation, but they'll get the same amount of clean air from HEPA filters, where really the poor places should be having more help. Uh, so this, this building readiness plan, it goes through how, what the design occupancy of the space is, what tools are being used to provide clean air, uh, any old mechanical drawings or BAS drawings, so all the information that's there, and uh, disclosure about commissioning. So really, if you have the building readiness plan, it ensures that your, your space is at least designed and set up to, to provide a low-risk environment. Now, this is an infographic I worked with a few graphic artists. You can get it on my website, which is it's airborne.com. Not everything can be done on the building level. There are things that have to be done on the individual room. So for, I came up with the acronym WATCH, Windows, Air Movement, Thermostats, CO2, and HEPA filter, of course, the Rosenthal box. So I'll go through them one by one, but Windows, the facility manager can't go around and control all the windows all the time. It really is something that's controlled in the space. So uh, having proper communication about trying to keep windows open Open as much as possible. You have to ensure that the place is comfortable from a temperature perspective. So even in the winter, you can't generally can't have them open all the way, but at least keeping them cracked does help promote better airflow in the space. Uh, a tool that I always use when I'm going to look at buildings is checking the air movement. There's a picture here of a diffuser from that you find in most mechanical ventilation systems. So I just take a stick of tissue and I hold it up to see if I can see air coming out, ideally, and I've seen this in a few places, you attach just a tissue or a ribbon right there, and you could look up and see, is there air actually coming out? I've seen places where they have that and the air doesn't come out. Uh, so they, but at least if you actually cared about it, you'd be able to keep an eye on it. And if there's no air coming out, it means the fan is not, is likely broken and it needs to be reported to maintenance. It does not tell you if uh, the air is clean, how much outdoor air, but it really is a first step to see if the fan is broken. The next step is the thermostat. This happened in my kid's daycare, but this is probably the most common thing you find in you know, small retail places, uh, dentist's office and doctor's offices. If the thermostat is set to auto, it means once the space temperature is satisfied, the ventilation shuts off. That's okay to use at night, but when people are there during the day, the thermostat should be, the fan setting should be on. It should always be providing ventilation to the space. Uh, this, this is a simple, easy step, and it could go a very long way. So the thermostat fan setting should always be on when people are there. 
Monitoring carbon dioxide levels is always a helpful thing to do to know if there's a problem. If CO2 is above 1,000 parts per million, it means the space is not compliant with ASHRAE, and that's a place where you'd want to, ASHRAE 62.1, and that's a place where you'd want to improve ventilation. Uh, that's not necessarily great, but that's bare minimum. If it's below 600 parts per million, then it's compliant with 241, which is really good. Uh, and the CDC recommendation is 800 parts per million. So it's a good idea to keep an eye on the CO2 levels to see if the ventilation is working. And when it breaks, the CO2 will go up and you can have it repaired. The last thing are HEPA filters. So they're put in the space, but I'm sure a lot of people have seen them off in many places. They need to be run and they should be run on the highest level noise tolerable. So noise is a big problem. There are ways to address it. And you also want it to be mixing air into the space. So if it's just blowing air into the corner, it's unlikely to be too helpful. You want it to be aiming towards the space and closer away from the walls, further away from the walls. Uh, but running them properly is a very important part, which really the occupants have control over. Just to go through all the tools that we have, and these are really the tools that are available currently in Ontario. One is ventilation, so you can improve it. Uh, and I've divided it into what you could do on the HVAC side and what you could do in the actual room. The five things in the in-room spell out the acronym WATCH. Uh, so on the HVAC side, you can increase the outdoor airflow to the space and ensure the ventilation system is running properly. Uh, you could upgrade the filters in the air handling unit to MERV 13. And you can commission the HVAC systems to make sure they're working well and create the building readiness plan to have that transparency that the system was designed properly in accordance with ASHRAE 241. Conversely, inside the room, the tools are one, make sure the thermostat fan setting is on, try to open up windows to get better outdoor air, into, more outdoor air into the space, uh, use a HEPA filter or a Corsi Rosenthal box in order to improve filtration in the space. And to verify in transparency, you can check the airflow and monitor carbon dioxide levels. So I'm going to go through two examples of different spaces and how we can apply ASHRAE 241 to these two spaces. Uh, I'll use classrooms. If you're using other spaces, ASHRAE 241, you could get a free copy online if you look up ASHRAE standards and guidelines. And it will tell you what the airflow per space is. In classrooms, it's 20 liters per second per person. So the first step is create a target. So let's say we have a classroom with 25 people. Uh, how much clean air do you need? Well, you just multiply the amount of people by 20 liters per second per person, and you have 500 liters per second. So in order to comply with ASHRAE 241 in infection risk management mode, you want 500 liters per second of air to the space. So let's say you look at the equipment and you find there's a rooftop unit that's responsible for the ventilation and it does supply 500 liters per second of air and that's actually not pretty common. 30% uh, of it is outdoor air though. You usually don't supply 100% uh, outdoor air when you're supplying that much air to the space. So if you just multiply 500 by 0.3 and 0.7, you'll see there's 150 liters per second of outdoor air supplied to the space and 350 liters per second of recirculated air to the space. Now, if you find how much outdoor airflow per person, it's six liters per second per person. And now you could use carbon dioxide to verify that. Based on the chart I showed before, uh, that would be around 1,100 parts per million of CO2. So if you have CO2 below that, that's great. And if it's above that, you know the unit is not operating properly. Now, let's say the next step the school wants to do is upgrade to MERV 13 filters. ASHRAE 241 says they're 77% effective. So what you would do is you take the recirculated air, multiply it by 0.77, and you would find now you have 270 liters per second of recirculated clean air, so filtered air. So how much clean air do we currently have to the space from the rooftop unit? There's 150 liters per second of outdoor air and 270 liters per second of clean recirculated air, which is a total of 420 liters per second. So now, uh, we have to, that doesn't get us to the 500 liters per second that was, we calculated at the beginning. So we can now size our HEPA filters and say, how much filtration do we need? So uh, you do 500 minus 420 and you end up with 80 liters per second of clean air. I will say that most HVAC systems are not really designed for 20 liters per second per person. Bare minimum ventilation is anywhere from six to seven and a half liters per second per person. And it, you can push them by upgrading filtration and increasing the amount of outdoor air. 
roughly to around 15 liters per second per person in full occupancy. Getting to that 20, generally you need additional in-room cleaning and HEPA filters are really the best tool we have, or of course your Rosenthal boxes. I included a graph here just to show you how the rooftop unit works. But you can see there's outdoor air and there's return air. That's what OA, EA is exhaust air. And you could control how much air ends up going to the fan. There's two dampers, uh, the outdoor air damper and return air damper. So by increasing the outdoor air damper and reducing the return air damper, more air gets exhausted and more outdoor air comes in. And then it's all passed through a filter, so you could upgrade that filter to MERV 13. I'll do another example. So this is a more poorly ventilated school. Let's say you have a classroom with 20 people. So what's your target? Again, you just multiply that by 20 in the classroom and you end up with 400 liters per second. So let's say this is a natural ventilation system. So it's only windows. In Canada, natural ventilation systems are very poor. I'd imagine in a place like Australia, uh, it would be a, a much more reasonable system when temperatures are better, but when it gets down to minus 10, it's very difficult to open up windows here. So let's say they have an open window policy. Now, how much outdoor air are you really getting? Well, you could monitor carbon dioxide, and let's say you find it's at 1500 ppm. Now, it's very possible you could have lower if the building leaks a lot and there's a lot of air just leaking in, and if you have a smaller classroom and uh, you, so you could have more outdoor air per person, but let's say you find it's 1500 parts per million CO2. But based on that graph again, it's four liters per second per person, which means a total of 80 liters per second of outdoor air. Now our goal was to find, uh, to provide 400 liters per second. So there's no recirculated air with MERF for 13 filtration. So all we have is that 80 liters per second, and we could take our goal minus what's being provided about our air, and we know we need to provide an additional 320 liters per second, and that's how we size our air cleaners. That would be very difficult to do. Uh, from the noise perspective, there are some that, that are pretty good when it comes to noise, but that's a, a lot of clean air, and it shows the problem with poorly ventilated spaces. Really, to comply with ASHRAE 241, it's not an easy task, especially with the tools we have. Uh, in a lot of places, we can. So that's... Uh, a review of what schools can do, what people can do in order to try to provide a low risk environment for uh, airborne disease transmission. So that's it for me. Thanks so much, Joey. There's such an amazing amount of practical, easy to understand information there. Um, there's a lot of questions there. Um, maybe we could leave them to the end as part of the discussion, um, if that's okay with you too, Amanda. Um, you know, not long after the pandemic started, um, I personally did invest in a CO2 monitor in Aranet, um, and I carry this around with me all the time. Um, and I did actually buy a CO2 monitor, a cheaper version for my partner. It's got a little key ring attachment device on there as well. But it's something that we can all do to keep an eye on what, what the indoor air quality is like. Um, so I think Probably the best thing to do is now hand you over to Paul Silvestri, um, and then we can um, go through the Q and A's after Paul. So over to you, Paul. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so just a confirmation that uh, you can hear me and that the slides are being shown. Looks good. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. So uh, I was. Uh, brought here today to provide uh, frontline staff perspectives and concerns and the opportunities that the workplace parties and the school community uh, can bring towards, you know, addressing the, the concepts of indoor air quality ventilation. And especially when it comes to, since this is a OCH COVID-19 webinar, um, where we are with COVID-19 and what are the ongoing problems that are facing uh, staff, students, and uh, those in general in the school community. Uh, so today's presentation, um, from where you are, I don't know, but welcome. Um, the description on the right will indicate the kind of mood that this, you're in today. Um, so today's presentation will cover where education staff are approaching the third full school year during the pandemic and why there's a problem and how we could start to find our way out of the woods. 
so the the title "Wandering in the Woods." I have to uh, thank Val Valerie Wolf from OCAL for providing that suggestion for a title because I think it's very apt uh, in that a lot of staff members and unions uh, have ongoing concerns and uh, unsure about how we're going to resolve those those concerns. And mainly it stems around repeated infections from, from exposure at work. Uh, missing work uh, causes workload issues and stress for, for many workers. And with each infection, uh, staff notes that it brings an increased risk of post COVID-19 condition, or as some people call long COVID or the lingering effects of an infection. And we still have elevated risk groups within our, our school community to mention pregnant women in, immunocompromised and those who have been previously infected um, are at a high risk group for getting longer uh, or ha having longer infections or for having more serious infections with post COVID condition. Um, workers often feel solely responsible for protecting themselves at work from COVID-19, which is this public health framework that you should assess your own risks and go out into the community and wear a mask and things like that. But within workplaces, we have occupational health and safety requirements. And it's, it's a legislative framework to ensure that the workplace parties are keeping up their requirements and ensuring that the workplace is safe. Uh, but in Ontario, I can attest that the Ministry of Education has not published any guidance for the for school boards to deal with uh, COVID-19 or RSV and influenza for this upcoming school year. And I, I find that very troubling since we've, uh, the experiences that happened last fall into the winter and with the overcrowding of hospitals and the, the amount of school absences and short staffing that occurred because of it. Now for unions, a, a lot of the communication that we are trying to present to a lot of our members is that we want to move the perceptions about COVID-19 away from a flu-like disease uh, towards thinking of it more as a, as a damaging multi-organ disease with a respiratory phase. Because I think there's still a lot of minimizing that happens with, uh, with COVID-19. And I like this, this uh, quote from Dr. Uh, Colin Furness, uh, epidemiologist, who said that to somehow evolved to be a nuisance cold, COVID-19 would need to become a different virus. And with the ongoing mutations and the different uh, variants, uh, we are we'll be dealing with COVID-19 and it's uh, different variants for, and, and mutations for a long time now. So reminding people that it won't go away in the face of no political or public will to do anything about it is a serious challenge and it facing everyone in the school community. And a lot of the uh, challenges in trying to get a grasp on how we can really solve the, uh, the issue is, or to understand its impact is by providing information. And we know we have poor provincial and local data on infections in schools. So the actual impact is difficult to assess because the incidence of the disease is not reported or shared within the school community, or in some cases with the health and safety committee. So we know that outbreaks happen in schools. Um, we've talked about it earlier and uh, on average, children will suffer six to eight upper respiratory tract infections annually. And we know that they're more prevalent during the school year and that uh, schools have historically dealt with outbreaks, whether they're respiratory viruses or whether they are contact viruses, nor, you know, norovirus, these things can spread rapidly through schools. And there are many factors that play into that, including you know, older facilities, poor ventilation or no ventilation in some circumstances. Uh, many schools are overcrowded. Uh, students are within close contact, staff are often asked to work in close contact because of the needs of the child. Um, pressure on students and staff to return from illness despite the possibility of being infectious. And I would also add pressure on many parents as well um, when it comes to taking care of their child and whether or not they're able to afford to take sick time 
it, there, there's a systemic issue that, that's present here that is contributing to so many uh, diseases within a school. Uh, outbreaks will continue. Uh, and that does not mean we need to accept the status quo. Um, the article that I'm, I put here in, in the, uh, at the side of my presentation here is from 2012. And I, I like that it says that some information need no lo longer be current. Um, we seem to have accepted that schools are places where kids go get sick. And we saw Amanda's introductory slide that talks about how the schools can then in turn affect the entire community. So why are we not looking at controls uh, like along the path, you know, at our, at our, that are often not considered? It just seems that there's too much of a reliance on the individuals to provide that. So, but this is a problem when we have outbreaks in schools is that we know that poor indoor air quality is associated with poor work performance and lower academic achievements. We heard that from Brad's presentation. So if you increase the risk of disease, you're also increasing the risk of short-term or long-term disability for staff. And we know schools are already suffering from understaffing. Even though we have pools of vocational staff, um, there's not always that pool that's available. And that, you know, they may not always be readily uh, available. So staff may be more sensitive these days to bringing the disease into the workplace, which is a good thing. COVID-19 really emphasized the whole point of self-isolation, staying away from work so that you don't affect the rest of your workplace. Yet, I know there's anxiety and stress amongst many members of our, of our union that they know that when they take time off from school, for absences, for illnesses, that they may, uh, the school community may suffer during their absence. And that's an added anxiety and stress upon them. And for some people, it may increase their workload the further they are away from school. So we know that short staffing uh, increases workplace violence uh, if there are delayed responses for um, incidents of workplace violence where there's a critical staff team that has to respond and those people aren't there, um, increases those risks. Uh, having short staff means that students might have their needs that are unmet, uh, contributing to this larger uh, problem with stress and burnout that um, has been studied and has been published, looking at what the pandemic and what short staffing has done historically within schools. So we have to remind ourselves that um, workers are just necessarily on their own, that you know, occupational health and safety language, sorry, occupational health and safety legislation requires employers and supervisors to take every precaution reasonable in the circumstances to protect the health and safety of workers. And this includes protecting workers from hazards posed by infectious diseases. That's just a quote from the Ontario's Ministry of Labor. So we have this, this acceptance that, you know, schools, infectious diseases, it happens, you know, but it would be incongruent to comply with this legislative requirement while letting uncontrolled respiratory diseases go unchecked and uncontrolled in the workplace. So we've talked a lot about ventilation today and Ontario schools have performed assessments on the mechanical ventilation systems, but we do not know to what extent rooms are meeting recognized indoor air quality standards. And from Brad and Joey's uh, presentations, we know that there are standards that exist, but are they meeting any of those standards? Are we having any kind of benchmarks? Do we have any kind of goals that we're able to say, here's what we're gonna go for, here's what we're going to achieve, here's how we're going to make the workplace safe for both staff and students. So I believe that putting the health and safety responsibilities on the backs of administration and staff within schools is the path of least resistance and that with leadership accountability and a collaboration at all levels, um, we can achieve something. Uh, we should also 
consider those occupational health and safety principles that you identify the hazards, you assess the hazards, you control them. And then finally, once those controls have been uh, implemented, whether they are indoor air quality standards, improved ventilation, opening air dampers, you know, are we evaluating to determine whether or not we've achieved our objectives? We have to go back and assess and control and look at those controls to find out where they are working and where they are not working. I'd like to add to the mix of this, of these principles by saying find, fix, and check. Uh, start measuring and determine where ventilation is poor. We can start with the CO2 that, that, that Joey mentioned. Uh, this is something that can be done at a school level with support from administration and school boards and with the government. And we also need that collaboration in the school community because when it comes to driving occupational health and safety within schools, we know that joint health and safety committees are uh, the, um, they are the, the driving vehicle for making change uh, for health and safety in the workplace. They're given legislative powers, functions, and duties to achieve that function. So staff, students, is there a means of reporting ventilation problems? This is an idea that I, I don't think hasn't really been discussed a whole lot is that there isn't a means presently in a lot of school boards for staff and students to report ventilation problems or if they're feeling symptoms of poor indoor air quality, such as you know lightheadedness or nosebleeds or um, if there are comfort issues as well. You know, your senses are usually the first to detect whether or not there are ventilation problems within a building. And I believe parents need awareness and input as well. I think they really need to know what is, you know, simple measuring of CO2 levels uh, and understand if schools are meeting any kind of objectives as well. So how do we get out of the woods? Well, we know that there's consensus on ventilation. Uh, here's another quote from Ontario's Ministry of Labor where they talked about that at a minimum, uh, worker, workplaces should ensure that HVAC systems are maintained according to manufacturer's instructions and to consider ventilation standards, such so as those from CSA and from ASHRAE. And they're even, they're even mentioning to consider going beyond those minimum standards if possible and that CO2 sensors may help to identify areas of poor ventilation. So how do we do this? We address the historic challenges by looking at our aging facilities that were not designed with indoor air quality uh, necessarily top of mind. Uh, we need to look at those aging facilities and determine how we can improve them, if there's any opportunities to improve them, whether it's through manual or mechanical ventilation. Uh, we can bring in HEPA filters. However, I look at those as a Band-Aid solution. They're a control that brings with it some other issues, um, noise being one of them. Uh, we have to look at um, our overcrowding in schools. We need to really look at if this is the proper learning environment that we want to provide to students. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, <laughs> providing the best education for, for, for students a lot. You hear that a lot. And there's discussions around, you know, curriculum. There's even discussions around, you know, evaluating the competency of teachers and evaluating the competency of trustees and things of that nature. But what is the, what is the learning environment that we're providing? You know, you can have the best curriculum, you can have the best teachers, but what is the learning environment that we're providing? So overcrowding, indoor air quality play into that. And as always, staffing to ensure that all students' needs are met uh, when it comes down to maintenance, whether it comes down to, to student supports, IT, whatever, uh, clerical. I don't wanna leave any groups out there, but it takes a whole community to run a school and ensure that they are properly staffed as well. Uh, so. Having a, and, and when it comes to staffing, I want to also mention is that a lot of school boards don't necessarily have a occupational hygienist who is experienced in, you know, things like ASHRAE standards. Uh, 
not a lot of schools have experts to provide that kind of, uh, you know, uh, assistance to the school community in achieving those standards. So, you know, we have to look at the government also to say, is there someone that is needed um, in these learning spaces that can provide and ensure that those standards are implemented uh, efficiently? So you can't leave it all up to the Joint Health and Safety Committee to do those things. So having a better grasp on school ventilation can help in future pandemics. And with the increased risk from climate change, you know, wildfire, you know, wildfire smoke, poor outdoor air quality, I think better indoor air quality is, is now and to deal with, you know, as I mentioned, pandemics or other epidemics like pickleball. So uh, I thank you very much for your present uh, your time today. That is my presentation. I've seen a lot of activity in the uh, the chat as I'm speaking. So um, I'll be able to take questions afterwards, I'm sure. But uh, I know Amanda is going to be speaking on what uh, what what what, I, what the school community, some of the actions that they can do as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, before we hand it back to Amanda. Um... I just want to make mention that we are interdisciplinary. Um, we do interface closely with um, professional engineers, Joey. Um, we are occupational hygienists. We've been running these webinars for not long after the pandemic. Um, and we did actually have um, a professor from the US, Lindsay Ma, and I provided a link in the chat box um, where she actually does go through particle size and you know, how the particles float around in the air. So, you know, OCO shortly after the pandemic really advocated that COVID is airborne. Um, just so some of those questions about particle size and efficiency of filters and all the rest of it. So I, I strongly recommend people asking about particle size to go back to our older webinars and, and go through them. But Lindsay Myers are definitely a good one to look at. Um, um, over to you, Amanda. Thanks. Thanks for that. Thank you so much. And um, there's some questions from both Joey's uh, section and for Paul as well that we can circle back to, I think, in this larger discussion. Um, and I think it kind of, you know, all of this information, I've been trying to kind of, you know, take this all in because a lot of it is super technical and we're, we're balancing all these different things. And so I think Paul's statements speak so well to the idea that we are working in this environment where it is an occupational health and safety issue, but it is also about the environment that we are creating for kids and then those outbreaks into community and how that impacts everyone. And, you know, I think we all understand that, that, that sense of nihilism or denialism that we get hit with um, when we're trying to advocate for these changes. And, um, you know, I think, before I kind of get into, uh, you know, some of the things that have been tried across Canada and, you know, it really, there's all these things at play, right? There's the 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 acceptance of what um, level of illness in schools is allowed or what, what we should expect. Um, and, you know, this has shifted over time and, you know, we, th we thought it would get better, but it's, it's actually gotten worse in some ways. And, um, you know, the misunderstandings about the impacts of COVID and then the, the difficulty in helping people to understand the, the, the impacts of COVID and then how this exacerbates all these other issues that, um, you know, so many people in the chat have mentioned about staffing issues and, you know, interrupted learning, which is kind of what it all comes back to. Um, and, you know, I think that in this presentation, in the, the past presentations, we've seen kind of all these things that kind of clarify those misunderstandings that I think a lot of people have heard when they've advocated for these things, you know, like we meet the ASHRAE standard, which is very vague and, you know, oh, HEPAs are not recommended. And, uh, you know, we, you know, alternative air cleaners, that means HEPA filters, so we can't use them. And, um, you know, I think it comes back to the idea of, uh, as a parent, when I've been advocating uh, that I'm often told I'm the only person who cares about it and you don't get to see that there are lots of other people who do. 
And then, you know, there's this adversarial relationship created between um, parents and teachers because teachers are not being supported in a collective way. Um, and they're not necessarily getting the information and they're not understanding or being protected. And also then kind of say, well, we don't deserve any better because schools are just where people get sick. So it's it's kind of looking at, you know, as, as a parent, I'll always say, how can I provide information to teachers um, and say to them, I, I care about you and your work environment, and this is not a luxury, but it's something actually that you deserve and is part of a safe workplace. Um, and then also, how can we work together to make these spaces safer for you and for kids? And so in the chat, I did post, um, there was this um, really successful session that some Alberta teachers presented, um, and they presented with um, Dr. Joe Vipond, um, uh, who's an Emerge doc in Alberta, and um, uh, Dr. Gosha Gasparovic, who's a developmental biologist um, who's been tracking all the trends of the pandemic, as well as occupational hygienist Dorothy Wigmore. And uh, this was kind of another multidisciplinary example of saying, we can take all these things and put them together and show and then put it into an educational context and say, we can actually make these changes and um, empower teachers to be doing these things. And I think a lot of the successes that we've had on these advocacy moves are from the grassroots level. And, um, you know, yeah, there's there's uh, comments in the chat about the, you know, people actively opposing those measures. And it's it's very frustrating to see when people actively oppose clean air in schools. It's very bizarre and hard to see when, uh, when wildfire smoke has now become part of the equation. Um, and so I think that's kind of where we've gone in looking at the, the, the pain points for people of when acute sickness, it seems like that's when people seem to pay attention, <laughs> um, and, which is hard because you want to prevent these things. But, um, you know, also looking at, you know, saying, building those relationships and collaboration um, and saying we demand better from, uh, you know, the the school boards who should be uh, protecting people in these schools and from governments who should be looking at these uh, different things. And so before getting into that further, like I would love to bring in Kathleen Gad, who's she's another advocate who's been working, um, you know, on these things. And I would love for her to speak to some of the successes that um, New Brunswick has had, because we've all taken these different tacks and um, I would love to hear kind of the story of what they've been doing. Good, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Great. <laughs> so I'm in New Brunswick. Right now I'm in a doctor's office, but I'm not a doctor. Um, this is just the quiet location that I can access today so that I could speak to you without my children also trying to speak to you. Um, I want to start by saying thank you to the organizers. Thank you for having me. Thank you for putting this on. And looking at people's concerns in the chat about uh, how do we reach people, I wanted to make note that um, Joey Fox has come on the radio uh, with CBC New Brunswick, I want to say three times, two or three times over the last couple of years. And I think that Joey's segments with our uh, CBC um, interviewers have reached a lot of people and it was always so exciting to hear that Joey was going to be on the radio. Um, so that's kind of a, a really nice way to reach uh, the every person because we are definitely in a position now where it is hard to get uh, relevant information out to people. Um, and some people in the chat have been mentioning CO2 monitors. So if you're in Canada, I just want people to know about CAVI, Community Access to Ventilation Information. And uh, that's run by some volunteers that have received a grant, some money for CO2 monitors, and they're giving them to public libraries. CAVI is about to send out their last set of, I think, 100 CO2 monitors to Canadian public libraries. So if your region hasn't um, become part of that program yet, you want to look up CAVI uh, this weekend and send it along to your public library. New Brunswick is an area where um, we haven't successfully gotten the public libraries to participate in CAVI yet. So nobody can borrow a CO2 monitor in New Brunswick, which is a real shame because to get a good one can be a little bit expensive. 
So I just wanted to mention a few things that have happened in New Brunswick. Um, I'm going to send a link in the chat right now to a story uh, on CBC about our legislature. So in June of 2023, our opposition uh, party in New Brunswick brought forward a motion to modernize the Clean Air Act in New Brunswick. And that would uh, acknowledge COVID as being airborne, acknowledge other diseases as also being airborne, and um, they want to measure and improve the air quality in all provincial buildings. It is a non-binding motion because it was an opposition motion, but it passed unanimously. So our governing party right now is the Conservative Party in New Brunswick. In the legislature, we also have um, some Green Party members and Liberal Party members, and uh, there's right now no seats for the New Brunswick um, NDP. So, but just to give you an idea that members from all of those represented parties made statements supporting the Clean Air Act being modernized and recognizing the, the importance of clean air. Because it's not binding, we don't see any results from that yet. And there's really no way for us to know how is that actually going to be implemented, to what extent. Um, but it was nice that it passed unanimously and that we actually have now 90 minutes in the legislature of various politicians from various parties making these statements about clean air. So I, I just made um, a tiny URL so that people can view that debate if they wish, just so that you can get an idea of what are the kinds of things that um, MLAs you know, are, are saying about clean air, how can we maybe resonate with some of our politicians. Um, so I'll send that tiny URL in the chat as well, and I'll give you the timestamp for when the clean air debate started was two hours, 26 minutes and 40 seconds for anybody that wants to look that up. Um, the debate will be transcribed and written out as well in New Brunswick's Hansard, but that's not done yet. Um, so unfortunately, there's no written transcript of that debate yet. But if you wanted to uh, listen to it in English or French, um, it starts at about that two hours, 26 minutes and 40 seconds. How we actually got that to come about, we don't know. Uh, I think it's a mixture of luck, timing, the opposition party was interested, New Brunswick is small, New Brunswick Twitter is quite engaged and involved. We did have, um, I'm also a member of Protect Our Province New Brunswick, Pop NB, and so one of our members who is also a teacher, Ryan Murphy, he clipped the video of the motion being introduced in April, and that went viral on Twitter because I can see from the representation here today, we have people all over the world that are interested in clean air, and yet there's so little success for us to point to that the few regional examples of success we kind of are all aware of those, right? Because we're pointing to that and we're saying, yes, this is what it should be like. We need to be like that. So when Ryan did a video clip of the motion being presented in April, it was shared, you know, tens of thousands of times. And so I think that that helped the politicians in New Brunswick to realize, okay, there are a lot of eyes on this, um, provincially, nationally, and, and globally as well. So uh, the New Brunswick Lung Association also supported that effort. And I would recommend anybody that has a lung association, some of them are independent now provincially, some of them are still with the Canadian Lung Association, but there's been a bit of an organizational rearrangement there. Um, you may wish to reach out to your lung association. I have noticed that with the lung associations, with the wildfire smoke as well, a lot of them have messaging now around respirators, um, around cleaning the air. So it's good timing to reach out to the Lung Association near you and see if they might be willing to support something similar. Uh, the other things that I just wanted to mention briefly for New Brunswick, um, the, our same member that kind of helped with the, uh, the legislature, Ryan Murphy, who's a teacher, he had also approached the New Brunswick Teachers Association executive. And what he did was he took Dr. Mona Nemmer's post-COVID condition report from March, 2023. So in Canada, we have this chief science advisor, uh, Dr. Mona Nemmer, and she and a team had just published in March, a long COVID or post COVID condition report. And he took 
that report to the New Brunswick Teachers Association executive. And he said, look at this report, teachers are at risk, um, you know, we, we should do something about this. And what they did was they came back to him and they said, could you write us a brief about this so that we understand it better? So Ryan wrote a 13 page brief. And if you wanna contact me, I can share it with you. Um, our uh, pop mb website is protectnb.ca and we have contact information on there so i could email you a copy of ryan's brief and what he did with that brief that was awesome was he tied together dr mona nemmer's post-covid condition report and motion 36 which was the clean air act motion so he linked together both the proof of the hazard the proof of the danger for staff and the solution which was already receiving some political attention, right? So he linked those together in his 13 page brief. He has a glossary of definitions for CO2, parts per million, all that stuff. And he has a page of references at the end and the very last page is Joey's, Joey Fox's watch graphic, which I wanna say thank you for, Joey's had that translated as well. And in New Brunswick, we are a um, bilingual province. So having access to information in French and English is extremely important um, in New Brunswick. So yeah, so that's what's happening with the New Brunswick Teachers Association. And from Ryan's brief, they uh, created a motion and I'll just read it to you here. The MBTA executive um, created a motion that said that MBTA work with relevant partners to lobby the government of New Brunswick to make transparent how air quality in schools is currently measured and make reporting and transparency around findings readily available. So that um, was the motion and the executive of the New Brunswick Teachers Association carried that motion. And the same thing is taking place right now with the New Brunswick Medical Society. There are two motions that they're gonna vote on next month at their AGM about the importance of clean air and about long COVID. So we kind of have to work, a lot, like a, a lot of the theme of today has been talking about um, empowering and informing the people with power in the, in the institutions, and then also empowering and informing the general population, um, you know, the parents, the community members and all that. So you can see that the work that we're doing, we're trying to work through these various executives to have them recognize the importance. But like people have pointed out, the more general population you have that's informed and empowered, the easier that that... Um, that, that turn right happens. onto Shermer Road. In a quarter mile, turn right toward Illinois 68 East Dundee Road. Somebody needs to mute. Um, and I'll just mention quickly that Protect Our Province New Brunswick, uh, we just had a mask drive for back to school. We raised $1,700, which for a province like New Brunswick in the financial times that everybody's having right now, that was way more than we expected to raise. And we have a mask champion in five of our seven health zones that those masks are going to go to that mask champion for local distribution. Um, but I also wanna highlight that inequity with the French and the English and the geographic areas. Um, we have seven health zones and we only have mask champions in five. So the two that we don't have anybody in are the Northern New Brunswick Francophone regions. So it's really important, but challenging to make sure that you have uh, kind of access throughout the province and information. Um, so yeah, I think that's about all that I, that I was uh, planning to talk about. Um, and I hope that that is helpful. Oh, we also have uh, Brilliant Labs is the name of our kind of outside of this education department um, STEAM group. They're like an outside group that is trying to promote uh, STEAM and, and comes into the classroom and does projects. So for two years, we've been trying to get them to add Corsi Rosenthal boxes to their projects because it's a very natural fit with what they do. And they were interested, but nothing ever happened. And finally, just a couple of weeks ago, they mentioned that it's on their list now for their projects. I'll believe it when I see it, but they seemed um, interested and enthusiastic. So that would be a nice change. As far as our Department of Education themselves, we don't have any engagement, any uptake. They're just a complete stonewall. They refuse to admit that there's any problems. Um, about 12% of the schools in New Brunswick don't have mechanical ventilation. And those are the only ones that they will measure the CO2 
because I think that they're aware enough to realize that, you know, that is very obviously a problem. Um, and they do report those findings, but the school year starts next week and they've yet to report last year's CO2 readings. So we do have a very hard time communicating with our actual district. They did commission a report from a quasi-governmental science group in December 2021 called RPC around the use of HEPA in classrooms. And now anytime a parent brings up HEPA with the district or the department, they're just like, mm, this report says we didn't need them. And the report is two years old and that's not even what the report says. Um, so, you know, we, we still have a lot of challenges and we're yet to see, I think, that many on the ground um, solutions, but it's nice that we are working together and seeing some uptake. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, and I, I just kind of, I have a list of kind of, you know, steps, I think tangible steps that, you know, parents and school staff can can kind of take and we'll get into that a bit, but I wanted to circle back to some of the questions mentioned in the chat. Um, so there was a question directed to Joey, I think about, does 241 uh, actually uh, specify anything for non-infection mode that can be, you know, I think used f with advocates to kind of try and push that forward? So the design, installation, preparation, all that should be done before you have to go into infection risk management mode. As uh, was previously said, it's kind of flipping a switch and now all of a sudden you have to provide a higher clean air delivery rate. But having these systems in place, the building readiness plan, uh, ensuring the equipment is working properly, that all has to be done before infection risk management mode is activated. Uh, and again, a lot of what uh, should be done now or can be done now, ASHRAE 241 provides guidance. For example, with HEPA filters, one of the common uh, claims was they interfere with ventilation. We now have a standard that says if it's a well mixed system, which the vast majority of schools are, uh, any type of HEPA filter is or indoor room cleaner, in room cleaner is compatible with that. So we have, uh, so even if you're if you're implementing it in your non-infection risk management mode, you still have these guidelines on what to do. But uh, the difference between infection risk management mode is how much cleaner you have to supply. Yeah, and I think that's a really great point you brought up because I, a lot of people do get feedback. Oh, HEPAs interfere with ventilation. In-room air cleaners interfere with ventilation or they don't work or they're harmful. And, and so I think that is a good point for advocates to kind of point to to say there is an ASHRAE standard that specifically looks in sites that in-room filtration is part of the, is part of the toolbox. So um, I think that's really helpful. And the, the other question I want to circle back to you was, you know, Paul, you, you put so well together the, the, the kind of the need for, um, you know, staff to have this, this union involvement and, and what you've been putting forward um, in terms of occupational risk. And so there is kind of, you know, what, what can you say in terms of, you know, how we can be, um, you know, pushing unions at large to kind of be fighting for this collectively or, you know, what kind of things do, um, do unions feel like, you know, they can do and then what can we do to support that? Uh, it, it, it's going to take a multi different, um, you know, local, regional, provincial strategies to, for, for unions to get their message across. And, uh, I, you know, I'd like to have those dialogues with the government to find out what their what their what their plan is. Um, and I, I just don't I just don't believe that a, a hands off approach um, and letting school boards on their own take care of it is going to is going to to uh, to resolve the issue. Uh, and I and I believe what it also will take is um, when unions are advocating for uh, some kind of legislation or regulations around it that uh, it, it is not, you know, uh, it, it, a lot of the flack we get back is very much that it's self-serving, things of that nature, but very much when we're, we're proposing these things, especially when education unions are proposing things, it is always within the, uh, the learning environment that is kept in mind, uh, for, especially for those who 
you know, to live it and breathe it every day to hear the flack that comes back to say that it's just self-interest. No, these people have dedicated their lives um, to uh, into improving uh, students, uh, improving their lives and improving the learning. Uh, so I know, uh, you know, the unions, we sit on a provincial working group. Uh, it was mentioned in my bio. And uh, those are opportunities where uh, unions and uh, you know, school board representatives of trustees and principals, and uh, along with the Ministry of Labor and the Ministry of Health, uh, Ministry of uh, Education, can get together and to um, try to come up with some kind of solution, some consensus, some uh, agreement as to what can really be put in place. The other element that I think is missing is public health, and very often school boards will rely on public health when there is disease outbreak in the schools. So if there is a better alignment with public health and occupational health, it'll help to, um, to, to I think, facilitate those conversations and it'll allow also our members to have a better understanding because we're not all infectious disease experts, uh, but when you have public health who are advocating for these things as well, and recognizing that occupational standards also provide standards for students as well, uh, we can uh, obtain those objectives a little bit better. Great, and we've had some interesting engagement in Alberta uh, with the Alberta Federation of Labor and, you know, uh, kind of talking to members about their own risk. And they, I think it does kind of, as you say, lend itself to, you know, having to start at the grassroots level. And again, uh, combating that idea that, you know, we just have decided that, you know, anyone who's in a school all the time is just going to get sick all the time. And that's just what we accept. And um, I think that that's kind of, you know, convincing people that both staff and students uh, deserve better than that and that it's a baseline is is so, so important. Um, and I think, you know, as Joey was saying about, you know, the takeaways from 241 and um, the collaborations that we've had as advocates with with experts, um, you know, looking at the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force guidance, which um, was kind of the precursor document to 241. Um, it's it's interesting because for me, I see the takeaway being something like, you know, now this is a standard. Um, and we we got a lot of feedback saying, oh, well, that's just guidance or, you know, and it's not, you know, and so I think that, you know, though we have these these uh, drawbacks of of, you know, that it's it it only applies in certain things. There's there's not necessarily a an on switch that is dictated in terms of when infection control mode would be implemented. Um, Again, we speak to the the in room air cleaners being part of the standard, and the acknowledgement that uh, that schools uh, need more ventilation um, with the CFM per or the liter per person mes uh, measurements because of this risk calculation, right? Um, and so I think those are all things that I take away from this that are really important. Um, going back to the chat. Uh, so Greg is just asking, um, so yeah, so Joey, did you just want to look at Greg's question here? And yeah, is there anything that provides that baseline beyond 62.1 that we as advocates can kind of look, look to and say to school boards? So the question is increased outdoor airflow rates or increased total clean air rates? Hey, Joey, this is Greg. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, sorry. Yeah. So I, just knowing that the experience of many parent advocates has been administrators not wanting to talk about anything infection or control related and understanding that 241 is specifically about infection control. I was wondering if it does anything to establish a baseline in excess of 62.1 for clean airflow standards beyond the infection risk management mode. No, it does not. Thank you. I think the challenge there is that, again, there is a baseline both with 62.1 and that it that the systems need to be operating as they're designed. And as Joey spoke to, the idea of that the maintenance and the repair and 
the actual measurement um, is kind of where we're supposed to start. And I think a lot of that has been missed um, by facilities operators and, and governments from the beginning. And so, you know, I think looking into you know, the questions of what can we be doing and what has worked and uh, uh, Kathleen spoke to it in New Brunswick. And, you know, for us in Alberta, I can say that some of the interesting things we've done is had ventilation experts um, and partnering with our local ASHRAE chapters um, to, to write letters to school boards. And so we had the Alberta chapters of, of ASHRAE write letters to school boards and specify these things. And so that puts it on the record that, um, that you know, these are the things we need to be looking for. And that was for the, the, the epidemic task force standards. We also had, um, we also had an expert address trustees on the record. And so it's really important, and I think with these, um, you know, uh, motions in government as well, to put these things on the record that this is the reality, that um, this is what we can actually implement in schools. This is, these are the impacts of illness um, and COVID for, for all the people who occupy schools. And it kind of works to counter that, all of these misinformation things that people start to make decisions based on. Um, we've also done a lot of um, freedom of, of information requests for school boards because um, that lack of transparency, um, the transparency that we should have um, from, from school boards has meant that, you know, we have to find this information and it gives us a sense of what, you know, what they do know and what they don't know because, um, you know, the responses we get as, as parents and as staff sometimes don't make sense or they're not you know, reflective of what what information school boards are actually working on. And so that's really important to have that information, um, you know, and then looking at, you know, once you have that information, looking at the people responsible and we've looked at, you know, what are the responsibilities and um, Paul spoke to this about what government should be doing for occupational health and safety. What are the responsibilities for the different people within um, within school boards who are part of professional associations? And so, you know, Joey, as an engineer coming in and speaking to this as an expert, there are people who are trained and licensed within um, within school boards who, you know, it is beholden on them to understand these standards. And um, you know, when they're working from this information, that has big policy implications. And so. Um, you know, that's a really important aspect that we found in Alberta um, and looking at, you know, what are those responsibilities for all the different members um, within these organizations? Um, and the other thing is being ready for when the information will be <laughs> readily received. And so it's, it's this really challenging thing I find personally to have, um, to you know be going into this year and as we say we look to the, the past we look at our potential future and we don't see a lot of action and the the biggest successes that um you know we've seen in advocacy are um when that pain point hits and people you know the idea all of these swirling things about immunity debt or you know like what what works and what doesn't work when people are are in the thick of it and they want to keep trying to work and go to school and do all these things that a lot of people are very receptive to these solutions and so it's it's about being ready when people um when people come calling <laughs> um joey did you want to add anything else you know from your perspective and i know you have the advocacy side and the tech side um and the engineering side experience as well I'll say actually the advocacy side on the local level is really not my strength at all. And that's where a lot of the people here and uh, community needs to step up. It involves outreach, uh, building relationships with facility managers, building relationships with administrators, uh, people like that. I've been working one on educating. You want to do the outreach, but then you need to know what to ask for. So that's what I've been educating people on what, what they should be asking for and what their goals are and how to do it. I've also been working on the political side with the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, but right now there's no legal requirements in Canada to provide acceptable indoor air quality. Uh, there are requirements when you're designing buildings, but it's really important on the advocacy side on like the grassroots level. I'm going to paste something into the chat. There's a person on Twitter, her name, I, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, is Liesl McConchie. Uh, she has succeeded in 
you know, reaching out to her school. She has a great resource that she put online. So I just uh, put the link there. And that's something that really individuals can do and probably do better than I can. So re reaching out and, and trying to get your schools or organizations on the local level to implement a lot of these policies. Uh, I'll just also say on it's airborne.com, my blog, I'll be posting very soon what I discussed and the link to that. So if you want like an offline, an online resource, but off of this, uh, in the form of a blog post, I'll be posting that soon. Yeah, and I think that it goes back to like that we, you know, the advocacy part for us is making sure that we are, you know, the the part of the pushback we get a lot from school boards is, well, you know, it's not really a concern for parents or it's not really a concern for staff. And it's really hard for people to be voicing that concern when they're also being told that the spaces are safe and that that this illness isn't a huge risk or that sickness is normal. And so, um, you know, part of the advocacy part of of making sure that people are aware that that it isn't normal and that we deserve more and that raising that noise and that it it may often feel like you're the only one who's who's speaking out on this, but you're definitely not. Um, you know, we've had uh, letter writing campaigns as well that, you know, we've had hundreds of people write letters um, um, to to school boards. And it's, you know, it's that technique of if you feel like you're alone and then you drop off and then there's they say, well, nobody asked us to do anything. So <laughs> so that's a really important part of it, too. Um, and I see we're coming to the end of time. This has been such a robust session. And um, Kevin, did you want to kind of add anything and wrap up? Yeah, I was looking for a tweet um, from William Banfleet. So William, you know, he's the chair of Ash the Ash Ray Committee. And there's a really good um, a Twitter session between Joey and um, William. And what resonated with me was the, you know, the importance of groups like yours, like us, and the coalitions and the advocacy groups to push things forward, because it's not going to happen from the government, let's face it. And, you know, we all, and I'm also thinking about a comment that Lisa Brosu made to me ages ago about, you know, I asked her why we're in this mess, and she talked about epistemic trespassing, um, you know, the infection control people kind of ruling the roost. I think each of us have a, a role to play, you know, and OCAO can provide the knowledge and the expertise, you know, bring in experts like Joey and others. Um, but, you know, your group and also unions play such a huge part in this. Um, you know, recently there was an exposure limit set for diesel in mines, and it was because of the USW really pushing for that. So we all can play a very um, important part together we also need to understand where where we fit in kind of thing and uh, you know i'm i'm an occupational hygienist i i learn about advocacy and i'm trying to do be an advocate but really my strength and, and, and many of our strengths in these kind of roles are, are more technical and scientific so it's really great that we can provide this um format um where we can all talk about it and and exchange the knowledge for the advocates and the unions i guess that's all i had to share and I don't know if um, Val's done so much work behind the scenes. Val Wolf has done so much uh, work behind the scenes. I'm always really grateful for her to kind of pull all this together. And I work with Val's, but I just, I just really want to thank all of the speakers, Joey, yourself, Amanda, uh, Paul, and also um, Brad, and all the others, Kathleen, and the others from the school safety. Did you want to say anything, Val, um, just to close out? Um. Sorry, I'm not driving very well today. Um, so I, I just echo your thanks and very much the message that we've all shared is that there are technical solutions, but we need to engage all the, all the people at all the levels to, to make them happen. And so I really appreciate everybody's participation, everybody spending their Friday afternoon with us at the height of the summer, and especially, uh, especially the speakers. Um, who are here and also Brad from um, from Australia sharing his time with us last evening as we made his recording and um, we are planning to continue these sessions uh, probably once a month and looking um, at other related subjects because COVID is still a major 
public health and occupational health and safety issue. Um, but it also solving that, solving the airborne transmission can protect our health from so many other things. So um, that's all. And thanks, Kevin, for your um, continued leadership and, and um, hosting today. And I think that's, that's all. We don't, like, we should uh, wrap up. But there's also no absolute rush if anybody has any like pressing question. We will, there's been so much shared in the chat that we will save the chat and try to post it. We will post all the slides and we will post the video. It'll all be on the event post uh, that about this, this session that's on our um, front page. And that should probably be done, I would say, by Tuesday next week. And yeah, that's all. And, and um, don't hesitate to right to any of the speakers or or us if you have any if any questions or if we can be of any help with with individual workplace um questions or solutions so i think that's all thanks and i don't know if each of the speakers wanted to just say something um as a wrap up too i'll just add before we end that um you know we'll be looking at ways to do that peer-to-peer -peer support for for parents and for school staff um, you know, because I think that that's like, that is the, the network building that then, you know, pushes the grassroots and then helps put pressure on those, um, on those institutions. And so that's going to be something that as advocates across the country, we're going to be working on and, um, you know, hopefully we can all connect together and be doing that in a collective way because it, it, it resonates. So thank you so much. Thank you, Amanda. Anybody, Kathleen or Joey or Paul, do you want to add any? Last words. What what Amanda said. <laughs> Good. I'll just say with the publication of ASHRAE 241, we now know what needs to be done. We have a standard. We have we're in a much better place because of that. Now it's just implementing, which is on the advocacy side. And but we're already we're making progress. There is a cleaner revolution going on. It's going too slow. Hopefully we we can all work together to speed it up. But you could see many different policies going in place. CO2 monitoring is becoming uh, more popular. There's still resistance, but it's starting. Uh, upgrade, ensuring filters are better, MRF 13, that, that's starting with newer stuff. So we, we are starting to make progress and let's continue and make it go faster. On that note, what a great way to end. Thanks, John. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Kathleen, did you have any one last thing? I guess we didn't miss it. Sure, yeah. I mean, I was trying to reconcile, right, the fact that, so this is the fifth academic year that COVID is going to be affecting um, schools or communities or kids. My oldest child was in grade one when COVID arrived, and she's starting grade five. And so it's hard to reconcile the fact that I'm, sorry, my husband's now talking really loud in the room behind me. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, you know, I'm sending her into a school that feels more dangerous because there's no continuous masking and everybody's just putting their heads in the sand. Um, and that's really hard, but I can take some comfort in what Joey has just said, which is that at the start of last school year, um, we didn't have ASHRAE 241. We did not have the Chief Science Advisor's post-COVID condition report. We did not have the OSPE indoor air quality reports. We did not have Engineers Canada National Position Statement on Ventilation. Um, there are so many very strong documents and sources and standards that we can try to uh, show to people and um, convince them of that, of that importance. And probably nothing will convince them of the importance like another triple or quadruple demic starting in a, in a matter of um, days for some of us or has started already in the States. So, and I just want to say thank you. I'm always appreciative of anybody who continues to want to listen, talk, or think about COVID still. So thanks so much. Okay. Thanks everybody. Oh, and I should mention, sorry, yep. before we go, that Donate Mask is um, offering uh, a, a free um, package for teachers going back to school. Um, and it's, uh, it's like really exciting. They're gonna, I'm just gonna drop the link in the chat as well and, and repost it on Twitter that, uh, um, for back to school for safe air. So I'll just post that as well. I forgot, about, I, I post, I sent that to my uh, sister who's a teacher yesterday when I saw it. Um, and yeah, it's very generous and, um, 
and a great initiative, right? It includes a CO2 um, meter uh, CR box supplies uh, to build in the classroom. And what, there was a third thing, I think. Um, so it's fantastic. Masks, maybe. Okay, now we'll really say goodbye. Thanks. I think I'll say sorry. I just I just oh, thought yeah. of something. I think you know legislation is primary prevention, and you know what they've done say for the border with the Model Act, you know, and the recent private members bill um, that was presented not so long ago. I think we really need to work on the legislators as well, and maybe that's where you can help out, Paul, um, help us kind of work on that aspect as well. Thanks. Great. Okay. <laughs> we'll say goodbye again, um, but thanks again, everybody, for uh, spending the afternoon with us and for especially for everybody's continued passionate work to prevent illness and uh, aerosol transmission. Okay, I'm going to, I think, although I'm a happy host, I'm going to, oh, I think, Tony, maybe you need to turn it off.